What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at Noah More Parties. You can find my written work and my rankings for running backs in Dynasty Leagues, Devi Leagues, and Rookie Drafts at NoahMoreParties.com. And while you're at it, go ahead and go purchase the draft guide. BDGE.co, scroll down, hit the draft guide button. All my shit, like my data stuff for running backs is on there. I did like three quarters of the wide receiver evaluations on there. All the information you would want for the rookies in this draft class uh, are in the BDGE rookie draft guide. Go get it. It's 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 a good product. But today's today's video is not a rookie draft guide. Today's video is me evaluating trades. I tweeted out asking for people to send me screenshots of their trades. I'm going to rate and review their trades. So here we go. Let's do it. <laughs> The first trade, uh, I don't know if I should say people's Twitter usernames, but the first trade is from this guy um, who he gave up in a 14-team Superflex tight end premium league. He gave up Christian McCaffrey, TJ Hawkinson, Rashad White, the 314 in the rookie draft, and the 414 in the rookie draft. So essentially just CMC, Hawkinson, and Rashad White for Kyle Pitts, DeAndre Swift, Michael Pittman, and the 212 in this year's rookie draft. I could see this going either way. I I love Kyle Pitts personally. Loved him as a prospect. He he was dominant as a rookie, despite not you know he didn't score a ton of touchdowns. But like he's obviously as good as we thought he was as a player, as an NFL player. But I don't know when the circumstances are going to change for him to allow him to like reach the fantasy ceiling that it seems like he can reach. And with CMC as my RB1 in Dynasty overall, I'm trying to win now in Dynasty this season, given kind of, you know, the the, the way the board shakes out this offseason. CMC is my RB1. He's an underrated win now asset, maybe the best win now asset in all of Dynasty. And he's not the RB1. So uh, he's my RB1. And then there's Hawkinson, who in the short term, at least, like last season, he gave you a production advantage over Pitts, a significant one. So if things don't change for Pitts this year, you've also downgraded at tight end by acquiring him in exchange for a deal where you lose Hawkinson. And I think Hawkinson in a 14-team tight end premium league, good tight ends are a premium in that sort of league. I would say he's easily more valuable than DeAndre Swift in a league like that, where we don't like a Swift, you know, with David Montgomery, there's talk of them drafting beat. Like what happens to DeAndre Swift? Um, I think Hawkinson is clearly like a top five-ish tight end. And then like, I prefer Pittman over Rashad White. Like I, my last video, I, I'm not a huge fan of Rashad White. Um, and the 212 gives you like more access to the strength of this class than the 314 and the 414 do like at 212 in a super flex league and a tight end premium, you still have, you know, a band of Kanda, Kendra Miller, Zach Evans, like Ty J Spears. A lot of these running backs might still be on the board at 212, but that's not enough to make up for downgrading in my mind from CMC and Hawkinson to Swift and Pitts. So I prefer uh, the CMC side of this trade for the acquiring Pitts side of it. I give it a C minus. Not terrible, but I, I think you lost the trade. Uh, the next one is in a 12 team super flex, half a point for a first down, I guess, whatever, whatever that matters. This is a, a situation where a guy gave up the 101 in this year's rookie draft. So essentially B. John Robinson gave up the 101 as well as the 210 and the 311. So some, you know, a decent dart throw there in the second round, a long shot there in the third round, the 101, the 210 and the 311 for Brees Hall, and the 109. I lean Bijan over Brees Hall slightly. I agree with consensus there. Um, but I think that's mostly due to Brees Hall's injury. Uh, if Brees Hall had played like he did last season and not gotten hurt, then he would have been what we expect Bijan to be as a rookie. Like he was dominant on the ground, super efficient on the ground, uh, was a downfield pass catcher with the Jets in a way that he wasn't utilized at uh, Iowa State. Like, that's what we want Bijan to be, a 220-pound athletic freak who can run efficiently and contribute in advanced and high-volume ways in the passing game. That's exactly what Brees Hall was. If Bijan was coming into the draft and Brees Hall was healthy right now and hadn't torn his ACL, I would prefer Brees Hall over Bijan, but that's not the case. And then there's the, you know, the 109 is what? That's, in a super flex league, is going to be like Levis. Uh, it puts you outside that like top tier of like JSN, Jameer Gibbs, obviously Bijan, 
and then, you know, those three quarterbacks, like Stroud, Bryce Young, and Anthony Richardson. It puts you out of that tier, probably, unless there's some some reaches or wild things happen in the NFL draft. The 109 could be Charbonnet, could be Levis, could be Flowers, could be Addison, could be Quentin, jo- like, whoever it could be. Like, I think this trade, pivoting off of Bijan for Brees Hall and the 109, could make some sense, depending on what happens in the NFL draft and depending on what is available at the 109 when it's on the clock. Like, Maybe somebody reaches for Michael Mayer. Maybe somebody reaches for like a a fourth round Zach Charbonnet and you get, I don't know, Bryce Young or, you know, CJ Stroud falls to you at the 109 or something like that. Or people don't like Jameer Gibbs's landing spot. So he slips to the 109. Like that's where you can, you can pounce here in an advantageous situation at the 109. But because you've made this trade beforehand and now you've lost the Bijan bargaining chip and you're now locked into taking whatever is available to you at the 109, which maybe like Jordan Addison is the best thing available to you at the 109. You might not be excited about that. So I think basically my point is you didn't have to make this trade before the NFL draft, probably. Bijan, barring something just like completely wild, is going to be the 101 no matter what. Uh, So you took like a certain thing, uh, at least a short-term certain asset in Bijan, and traded it for a player coming off an ACL and a 109 that has a wide range of outcomes. And so there are certain certain circumstances where I would like this trade, depending on what happened in the draft and depending on what happened in your rookie draft leading up to the 109. But as of now, before the draft, I think you just sold Bijan for too much risk, uh, more risk than you needed to, really. I gave this one a C- as well. The next one is Devontae Smith in a 10-team Superflex tight end premium. Devontae Smith... And the 205, giving that up, getting back Kyle Pitts. This is one that I kind of go back and forth on a little bit. I can can honestly talk myself into either side. But I do think the hypothetical upside of Kyle Pitts, where he's a 90 catch, 1,000 yard receiving, 8 touchdown guy in your tight end spot is more valuable than Devontae Smith doing that. Because, you know, in your wide receiver slot, that's fringy wide receiver one type production, not quite as rare as it would be from a tight end. And so you, like, just less of a positional advantage there. And there's the 205, which could be, you know, Jalen Hyatt, Zach Evans, Devon A-Chain, Ty J Spears, Hennon Hooker, you know, whatever. You're going to have a good, a, a good, nice little selection there at the 205. But I don't think that's enough to pivot down from Pitt's to Smith, in my opinion. But really, I, I do acknowledge that this, this pick or, or this trade is just a bet on Kyle Pitts. If you think Kyle Pitts can be who we think he is, then you make this trade. And if you don't, then you're you're taking a, a an almost guaranteed low-end wide receiver one and turning it into a complete coin flip. So I see both sides of this. It's very fair. It depends on what you think about Kyle Pitts. Right this second, I, I believe in him. Five minutes from now, I'm, I might change my mind and prefer Devontae Smith, but I think think that one's a, a B. Let's let's scroll down here and, and see what we got. See what we got. Okay, here we go. A good one. 10-team, single QB, half PPR. This guy gave up DeAndre Swift, the 109 and the 110, and got back AJ Brown, Joe Burrow, Antonio Gibson, and the 210. I much prefer AJ Brown to DeAndre Swift. Uh, I'm not confident that DeAndre Swift is going to be a viable guy that we want, like, starting in fantasy, you know, at least as more than something as, like, a mid-RB2 type. A.J. Brown is a locked-in, like, wide receiver one for the next couple of years, probably a, a near-elite wide receiver one. I easily prefer him to DeAndre Swift. And the 109 or the 110 in rookie drafts this year, in single QB rookie drafts, you're probably going to be in quarterback range. It's probably going to be Bryce Young, Stroud, Anthony Richardson will start going off the board there. The other side of this trade, though, is getting Joe Burrow. Like, I would never have Joe Burrow see a quarterback class with, you know, three interesting guys and pivot to, like, unloading Burrow in favor of taking two dart throws. Like, I I just don't want to do that. If I'm picking a quarterback in that range, and if I don't, I'm probably reaching on somebody. I'd rather just have the sure thing in Joe Burrow where, like, if Bryce Young hits his absolute ceiling, he's just Joe Burrow. And, I, I, like, I already have Joe Burrow. Why would I want to pivot to the 109 and the 110? I understand, like, two shots, but, ju- like, a bird in the hand is worth is worth two in the bush here. And then Antonio Gibson in the 210 is just gravy. I, I prefer Burrow to the 109 and the 110 combined. I prefer A.J. Brown to DeAndre Swift. I'm not a huge fan of Antonio Gibson. The 210 is hit or miss in this class, but that that's just gravy on top of a trade that's already good. I give this an A+. Plus for the guy who got A.J. Brown. Uh, This next one's interesting as well. A 12-team single QB league. This guy gave up Javante Williams in the 102 
in a single QB league, the 102, and the 304 and the 306. So a couple mid-thirds, Javante Williams and the 102 for Kenneth Walker. This is this is an interesting one. And I, I think I prefer Kenneth Walker over Javante Williams in Dynasty, just like pretty much everybody else does. But I also think that that's mostly because of health. If Javante Williams had not blown out his knee, he wasn't very productive last, you know, last year before getting hurt. But if he hadn't blown out his knee, he would now be on a Sean Payton coach team. They might not have even brought in Samaj P. Ryan. But but either way, he'd be a young, talented running back with health. That's what Kenneth Walker is. That their their situations are fairly similar. Seattle's probably a slightly better offense to be part of right now than whatever we're gonna see going forward from from Denver. But while Kenneth Walker is far more valuable in Dynasty than Javante Williams right now, I think it's worth cons- worth keeping in mind that that's really because Javante Williams got hurt. He would probably be in like the RB 6, 7, 8 range if he hadn't gotten hurt, which is, you know, within striking range of where Kenneth Walker currently is in Dynasty. But I also don't think that the difference between Kenneth Walker right now, not in value, I understand the value is different, but like in what, how I view them as assets, I don't think the difference between Kenneth Walker and the 102 should be massive. Like, we don't know who's who's going to be the, the move at the 102 in a single QB league yet, but it's probably JSN or Jameer Gibbs. The odds that one of them gets a landing spot that we like enough and draft capital that we like enough to take them at the, or to be excited about them at the 102, you know, JSN in a spot where we're excited about, probably, you know, if, if he's, if he turns out to be what we think he is, that's probably a fairly equivalent asset to Kenneth Walker. Same thing with Jameer Gibbs. If he is what we, you know, in the NFL, what we think he is, he's probably a fairly equivalent asset to Kenneth Walker. And so if you just, if you ignore Javante Williams in this trade and just view this as Kenneth Walker for the 102 and a couple thirds, I think you're taking on more risk, obviously, moving Kenneth Walker, who's a little bit more of a sure thing, down to the 102 where you're you're probably going to get a guy you're excited about, but maybe not, and maybe they don't turn out to be a Kenneth Walker type asset. But I think that slight risk, I, I perceive it as slight, I think that slight risk is worth it with the upside of like the Javante Williams dice roll thrown in. So I actually like the Javante Williams side here. I realize that that's the riskier side. I'll give this this trade a C plus for the guy who acquired Kenneth Walker. And then the next one is a Patrick Mahomes trade, which I think are always kind of interesting. This is a super flex league. So Patrick Mahomes would be the clear 101, tight end premium PPR. This guy gave up Patrick Mahomes, Terrace Marshall, Jalen Tolbert, and a 2025 second round pick. So Patrick Mahomes and a bunch of nothing. So this is essentially just Patrick Mahomes for Brees Hall, the 103, the 104, and the 106. That's a lot to get back for Patrick Mahomes. It's pr- this trade is probably fair value wise, but I think I view this through the lens of like, how am I feeling after this trade from either side? I think the guy who got Patrick Mahomes here is not looking back. Like he doesn't care what happens with those picks. He doesn't care what happens with, with Brees Hall's ACL going forward. He has Patrick Mahomes, the locked in 101, the locked in QB1, a guy who He's not going to be the QB1 every single year for the next 10 years, but over the next 10 years, he's easily going to be the QB1. It's like Tiger Woods in his prime. It's like, is is it going to be Tiger or is it going to be the field? Sometimes the field might win, but it's always the field versus Tiger. And I think for the next 10 years in Dynasty, it's it's going to be the field versus Mahomes at the 101, at the QB1 spot. You have that locked in for the next decade, pretty much. I prefer that. Like, I'm not looking back. If I got the Mahomes side of this trade and worrying about like, oh man, well, if, if Jameer Gibbs turns out to be really good, like I lost. No, you won. You just, it's a, it, it's a super flex league. You have locked in the most important player in fantasy football for the next 10 years. You can, you can figure out the rest of your team later. The other side of this, of this trade, it's like, yeah, I know I gave up Mahomes, but I got Brees Hall, who, if he comes back from that ACL is going to be like an RB1, an elite RB1, plus, you know, a shot at, at, uh, you know, the meat of this of this first round of this rookie class where Bijan's probably going to go 101. And then the next five picks are going to be some combination probably of Gibbs, JSN, Bryce Young, CJ Stroud, Anthony Richardson, all guys who I think we should be excited about. You're going to get your pick of, of three of those five potential studs, but crazier things have happened than a talented running back slow, you know, recovering slowly from an ACL or never, you know, returning to form fully or then, you know, three rookie picks and only one of them hits or only two of them kind of hit or none of them hit like crazier things have happened than that. You traded Patrick Mahomes for four really nice young assets, but for 
relatively risky assets, especially compared to like the complete peace of mind that Mahomes gives you in your QB1 spot. If I have Mahomes, I'm not selling for this package. I need sure things. I need a large package of, of sure things. This trade does not give me that. So it's it's a decent return, more risk than I want to give up or, or than I want to take on for Mahomes. I give it a B minus for the guy giving up Mahomes, uh, an A for the guy getting Mahomes. And the last one I want to cover here is a great one. Superflex, PPR, I don't know how many teams, but it doesn't really matter. This guy gave up Jamar Chase for DK Metcalf, Geno Smith, and AJ Dillon. And he includes as, you know, kind of a, a disclaimer, he says, I got roasted for this one in the group chat. I needed a QB2. My only quarterbacks were Fields and Brock Purdy. My man, you still don't have a QB2. Geno Smith, okay, you might you might have a QB2. That's, that's a little too harsh. You might have a QB2, but you traded away maybe the wide receiver one, anywhere between the wide receiver one and like the wide receiver three in Jamar Chase, a guy who has already produced as an elite scorer at the position for the sake of upgrading your QB2 spot with Geno Smith a guy who is 10 years deep into his NFL career and just now became a viable fantasy starter. I'm not saying he can't do it again. He's probably a competent NFL player. Uh, we saw that last season. But, like, let's not kid our... You didn't trade for Jalen Hurts here. You traded for a guy whose ceiling is about what we saw last year. And even if Geno exactly duplicate, duplicates what he did from last season, 10 years deep, really good season a decade in, if he does it again, if he just does it again, the advantage that Jamar Chase gives you over a low-end wide receiver one, Jamar Chase scored about 20 points per game last year in PPR, low-end wide receiver ones, high-end wide receiver twos score like 15 points per game. So Jamar Chase gives you a five-point-per-game advantage over those guys. So that advantage, and, 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 okay, and that's just assuming, uh, uh, because like DK Metcalf is involved here, that's just assuming that DK Metcalf produces as a low-end wide receiver one, high-end wide receiver two, which he didn't. He scored 13 points per game last year and finished as the wide receiver 25 on a per game basis. So this is giving DK Metcalf credit for being, you know, way better than he was really. Two full points per game better, nearly 12 spots in the rankings better. But if DK Metcalf is a 15 point per game guy going forward and Jamar Chase is a 20 point per game guy going forward, that difference in points per game is the same as between Geno Smith and Taylor Heineke. Jamar Chase is offering you a massive advantage over DK Metcalf and upgrading to upgrading to Geno in your QB2 spot only makes up for that difference if you were going to start somebody worse than Taylor Heineke otherwise. If we just go through last year's fantasy points per game, you know, at quarterback, Jamar Chase plus this quarterback would have outscored DK plus Geno last season. Let's let's go through them. Jamar Chase plus Marcus Mariota would have outscored Geno and DK last season on a points per game basis. Jamar Chase and Russell Wilson and Jimmy G and Derek Carr and Carson Wentz and Aaron Rodgers and Ryan Tannehill and Matt Ryan and Taylor Heineke and Andy Dalton and Mac Jones and Davis Mills and Matt Stafford and Brock Purdy and Kenny Pickett. Jamar Chase plus any of those guys is a better combination than Geno Smith and DK Metcalf based on what those players did last season. It, like, this just wasn't a good <laughs> this just wasn't a good trade. Yeah, you got AJ Dillon, but he scored the same fantasy points per game last last season as like Clyde Edwards Alaire. Dude is ass. Jamar Chase is easily the best asset here. You should have gotten roasted in the group chat. And I give you, a, I have a D written here. This is an F. You should not have done this. You had an elite asset and you flipped it for three things that you, you, you sold for 60 cents on the dollar here. Shame on you. But there you go. That's me rating and reviewing trades. Hit like, hit subscribe, buy the draft guide, go to nomoreparties.com, follow me on Twitter. See you on, uh, see you on Wednesday before the NFL draft. Peace. Yeah.